are chapter oh, 10. Chapter 10. They call them derivative the markets. <laughs> Derivatives. So, we begin first with a derivative. Derivatives stands for a number of things, same as financial. Derivative, and it's also the same as, how they call it here, derivative security. Derivative security is a financial instrument, you can say a security, which derives its value from another security, from another investment asset. Alright, so, from the first lecture, we got the primary asset classes, primary asset classes. The first primary asset class was stocks. And from the primary, we don't call them secondary, we call them derivative. Stocks are going to have stock derivatives. Which means that these are derivatives whose value is determined by the value of a stock. Then you're going to have a bond. And we don't call them bond, bond derivatives, we call them interest rate derivatives. Then you have commodities. You're going to have a stock index. Stock index. Like Dow Jones Industrial Average. You're going to have a derivative on the stock index. Index will be an average of a number of, in this case, stocks. Stock index is an average of a number of stocks. Dow Jones Industrial Average is the average of 30 stocks. So you're going to have one derivative on the stock index. You're going to have NASDAQ. NASDAQ will be 
uh, a bunch of stocks, then we're going to have S&P 500. So it's going to be 500 biggest stocks. We're going to get an index on that. Then we're going to have some bond index. The bond index will represent an interest rate. Could be the interest rate on treasuries. Let's say treasuries. Could be an index on one-year treasuries. Then, with bonds, it could be interest in the index on high quality. We call these investment-grade companies. Investment-grade companies. Or it could be a junk bond interest. Okay. Same thing with commodities. You may have index on precious metals. You may have index on, index on agricultural commodities. You may have an index on what? Uh, base metals. You may have index on energy, okay, which are important commodities. And then currency. You could have on Japanese yen or euro derivative, but you can have a currency index like the dollar index. And the dollar index is an index that, that measures the value of a dollar as a weighted average against, let's say, euro and yen and a bunch of other currencies, Swiss franc and so on. So for each of these, you may have an index and then a derivative on that particular index. Let's see what else we got. Well, let's try. Now, types of derivatives. Types of derivatives, again, we have as primary and secondary. Now, it's important to understand the following. Uh, let's get it up early. It's called, I did it at the very first lecture, financial engineering. Financial engineering is the design of new securities design of new financial instruments. In financial engineering, you create a brand new security. That's what you do in financial engineering. Well, 99% of the time, you create a derivative. The result is a Derivative. The product is a derivative, which means the following. There are thousands of financial institutions, let's say 5,000 banks only in the United States, and 5,000 more banks around the world that have usually financial engineering departments who will be designing thousands of new securities every year and most of these securities will be derivatives okay so every year there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of new derivative securities which are created out of nothing most of these securities will eventually fail because they will not be adopted so now we have the primary one those that are the main ones. First main one is, well, let's see, what do they have here? Four words. Second main one will be futures. Let's see, how do they have them over here in the textbook? Oh, that's not there. Third one will be options. And the fourth one will be
swaps, the biggest and greatest growth in the last 20 years have been in the world of swaps, in the world of, maybe I'll get to it, maybe not in this course, what is known as credit derivatives. Credit derivatives are, again, derivatives, financial instruments whose value depends on the risk of credit default. In other words, these are instruments that insure or speculate whose payoff depends on the credit worthiness of a borrower. So, these are the four primary and then within each there will be hundreds of different types of forwards hundreds of different types of futures contracts there will be thousands of options and again hundreds of swaps let's see what else we got now all of these financial derivatives are called and are by law, by nature, contracts. They're all a contract. So, you're going to have a forward contract. You're going to have a futures contract. That's how we call it. Okay? So, futures is short for a futures contract. Forwards, forward one is a short for a forward contract. Options is then short for option contracts. And you're going to have a swap contract. So they're all contracts. Some of these contracts will be standardized. with very standard features like exactly 100,000 US dollars will be, let's say, the currency contract. Exactly 100,000 dollars up against the British pound. The British pound may be 62,500 British pound. So it's going to have a standard size, standard, standardized maturity, okay? Or the opposite of standardized will be customized. Customized means they're going to be tailored specifically to your needs. You need only $40,000. For the contract to be in a particular month, let's say in December, okay, and whatever is deliverable and so on. Okay, let's see what else we got. All right, well, the origin, where do they originate? Well, we got derivative contracts from 2,000 years ago in ancient Rome and even before that a little bit in Greece and so on. But we call these now modern derivatives and modern derivatives market. The origin comes after or post the gold standard. Gold has a stable value. Value of gold changes very little. And therefore, money based on gold is stable too, has a very stable value. Okay. And when money is stable, financial markets are relatively stable. When money itself is not stable, then financial markets are not stable. 
when banks, sorry, money is based on gold and currency is based on the gold standard, the banking system is relatively stable. Interest rates are relatively stable. On the other hand, when money is just paper money and the government can create a billion dollar, a trillion dollar, ten trillion dollar, or a lot of that money is created through credit, then money is inherently unstable. The value of money can go up a lot, the value of money can go down a lot. The value of the banks can go up a lot and uh, uh, go down a lot. So, as a result, during the gold standard, there were few or no derivatives for the simple reason that values were relatively stable. The whole financial system was relatively stable. During the gold standard, there were mostly commodity derivatives. If you uh, grow cotton, you want to sell cotton six months from now, you want to lock in a price. Uh, you'd have agricultural derivatives, maybe, maybe for pork and pork bellies, for whatever agricultural commodity, the biggest one in the West will be wheat. Here in the wheat, East it will be rice. Okay, so during the gold standard, then from 19, uh, what is it, let's just say 45 till 1971, we have a monetary system known as Bretton Woods. <clears throat> it is not a gold standard, it is dollar based on gold, so dollar is convertible to gold, and all other currencies are convertible to US dollars, okay? In this particular system, the dollar is called a key currency and is favored amongst all other currencies. This is what you're supposed to study in financial economics, money and banking, international finance, and so on. So, Bretton Woods was somewhat unstable. It wasn't a true paper standard where you have paper currency, we call it fiat money, but it wasn't a true gold standard either. It was like quasi gold standard. The system was somewhat unstable, but it was also somewhat stable. So, the system is a little bit unstable and there was no genuine need for derivatives. Now, and, well, what is it? August 15, 1971, right? That was when the link was severed between dollar and gold. A different way of saying is that, saying is that the dollar was no longer connected to gold. The dollar was no longer backed by gold, and the dollar was no longer convertible to gold. As a result, currencies, especially the dollar, began to fluctuate wildly. All other currencies began to fluctuate wildly. In other words, you had what is known as volatility. Prices can go very high, they can go very low. They can go high very quickly, they can go very quickly. Volatility, for those of you who had a basic course in finance, means and measures risk. So, higher volatility, prices just go up wildly and down wildly, this means the higher the movements up and down, the higher the risk. So the first thing that happened was that currency markets became extremely volatile. And as a result, let's take a look, I think it's 1972, if I remember correctly, uh, maybe, maybe not, uh, you had the first Currency
derivatives. These are mostly futures and forwards that try to lock in the price into the future. So, you don't know if the current exchange rate is this. After three months, the current exchange rate could be much, much higher, could be much, much lower. So, the first derivatives were basically currency derivatives. They called it, back then, IMM. And standing for International Monetary Market. International Monetary Market, where you got the first will be currency derivatives. Uh, later on, later on, we have the CBT. Chicago Board of Trade. And then have CD 40 one for options. Again, different markets, it's not as important for you to understand. Uh, again, in the US, you may have five or ten derivative markets, but then you go in London, there are a whole bunch of other markets. Later on, in Europe, you're going to have a bunch of markets. Now, a lot of derivative markets you already have in. Singapore and in Hong Kong, Shanghai is now developing a lot of markets. But let's get back over here. These contracts that are standardized, that are standardized, you got to move in out there, will be traded on exchanges. Will be exchange <coughs> traded. And that's the whole idea. The whole idea to standardize the contract is to be able to make it to trade it on an exchange. In other words, when it's standardized, you develop a secondary market. And the secondary market is highly liquid. If it's customized, it is generated and traded on the over-the-counter. And it's very difficult to trade. So, Liquidity of those standardized contracts are highly <coughs> liquid. And these are is that saying this thing there? Yeah, does it come up? So exchange traded derivatives are relatively liquid, very easy to sell or very easy to initiate or to buy very easy to get out of and over the counter derivatives are relatively illiquid. Uh, if your contract is for December for 40,000 it's not very easy to find somebody else who will want your contract with your size, your month and everything else. Alright, let's get back to where we are. We can clean up a little bit and get with the So, in the, let's take a look again, 1970s were markets were, currency markets were extremely unstable and highly volatile. You had currency derivatives. In the late 70s, interest rates begin to go up, and interest rates became extremely uncertain. So the 1980s were characterized by the growth 
development and growth of interest rate derivatives. And as interest rate derivatives grew up, in the 1990s were basically born and began to grow up, but they begin to explode in the last 15 years. Now the whole world is swamped by credit. derivatives and recently over the last 10 or 15 years there is a well I wouldn't say brand new it's actually a fairly old derivative that's become wildly popular like everyone's investing in it and here's a little problem very few investors in the world, even professionals, understand that these are true, genuine derivatives that can and will eventually cause a financial disaster called ETFs. ETFs. So, this was the growth of ETFs. An ETF stands for Exchange Traded Fund. An exchange traded fund is a security, it's actually a financial instrument which represents something else. You can have an ETF on bonds and it will behave just like bonds. You can have a gold ETF, GLD standing for gold, which will track and follow the price of gold. You can have a silver ETF, it will be tracking silver. You can have an oil ETF, it will be tracking oil. You can have an ETF that will be tracking NASDAQ, it's going to call it. It's called QQQ. So now you have exchange traded funds for everything. And these exchange traded funds are basically derivatives. They derive their value out of something else. Supposedly, if you have a gold ETF, there is gold stored somewhere for you. If there is a silver, there is silver ETF. If there is oil, there is oil stored somewhere. But a lot of times, there isn't anything stored for you. It's just an empty promise. A lot of times, the ETF will be based, let's say, on futures contract. So it becomes a derivative on a derivative. Okay. So these, now this exchange traded fund for practically everywhere, but when you invest in exchange traded fund, you're not investing in the security. You're not investing in a bond. You're investing in a security that's supposed to follow the bond, but not the bond itself. You're not investing in gold, but in security that supposedly has the gold. Or you're invested, let's say, in a uh, let's say a stock index, but the security probably does not have the stocks from the index, so you can't exchange the that security for the real stocks. It's they only say that it tracks the price. It follows the price. But you can't really exchange it for the real security, for the real world, which makes it a derivative. And 99%, 99.9% of investors don't have an idea that this is a derivative. They also don't have an idea that these ETFs are extraordinarily risky. They think, for some reason, that they're perfectly safe. Just like all of these investors thought that houses are extremely safe until they realize that the housing market can crash and that you can lose, that everybody can lose a lot of money in housing. So that's on ETFs. And now we get to forwards. So now we begin finally, after all of this introduction, is the first one, forwards. 
and forward is simply an agreement today to make a transaction sometime in the future. The transaction will be to a buy or sell some other asset. So, a uh, forward will have a particular asset. We'll exchange a currency, a stock, a bond, gold, commodity, whatever. A forward will have a maturity. We'll exchange it after three months. We'll exchange it after six months. We'll exchange it after one year. Okay. Uh, and a forward will have a size. A uh, hundred ounces of gold. One thousand barrels of oil. Hundred thousand US dollars or maybe hundred thousand euro. There's going to be a particular size. You're going to have a like any derivative or any financial instrument, you're going to have a buyer. You're going to have a seller. The buyer of a forward or the futures or any derivative is called a Long. That's how we call it. And the seller of a forward or a futures will be a short. A forward, let's see how we have these. Uh, things over here. Every forward will have a form of settlement. Settlement will be associated with how the contract is closed and how do you satisfy or fulfill the contract when the contract expires. We we'll also call it when the contract matures. Okay. And like most financial derivative contracts, you can settle by delivering the asset. We call it Delivery. So we agreed on 100 ounces of gold. There's going to be a bag of gold, 100 ounces. And we need to figure out the contract will stipulate where it's going to, the gold is going to be delivered. Maybe 100 ounces delivered in the bank. Or if it's cotton or oil in a warehouse. So it's going to say which warehouses I can deliver my cotton or my or, or rice. It could be, think of it like a thousand bags of rice. A page bag could be 30 kilograms or 25 kilograms, whatever the standard is. Well, where, you know, it's going to be in the classroom or usually a number of warehouses. So, settlement is most of the times through delivery or it could be cash settlement. Cash settlement means that when the time comes, you look at what's the current price and what's the contract price. Let's say oil in the contract is $40, and that right now is $45. The difference is $5. For 1,000 barrels of oil, this means it's going to be $5,000 cash settled. So it's going to be a compensation of $5,000 between the contract price and the current market price. Okay. So each forward, of course, each derivative, the most important characteristic, the most important part 
cost of a derivative contract, of course, is the price. That's the most important thing in the world. In, in the world of finance. How much for the gold, for the oil, for the rice, okay? So, uh, let's do this. I'll go back into this trick. Forward contracts are highly customized. The standardized version of a forward is called a futures. So, a forward is highly customized, it trades over the counter, it barely trades, it's issued by a financial institution, it is highly illiquid, very difficult to trade, very difficult to get out. Specifically for interest rates, specifically for interest rate, you have a very special type of a forward, which is simply called forward rate agreement. F-R-A, standing for forward rate Agreement, which basically means the following. Uh, I'm going to be building a hotel. I'll need the money a year from now. Now I'm going through, it's called permitting and government and all the other things. I don't need the money now. Uh, but I want to borrow a year from now. And I need to borrow to build a hotel, let's say 50 million US dollars. Okay. Well, now interest rate is 4% and I could borrow at 4%. But a year from now, interest rates could be 5% or 6%. So, I am exposed to future interest rate risk that interest rate will go up when I need the money. I can borrow today, but if I borrow today, I don't need the money for a year. I'll have to pay interest on that money. And then, worse, I got to figure out where to keep the money. So, I don't need the money now, I don't want to borrow money now, and I don't definitely don't want to pay interest on that money. And I don't have to worry where I'm going to put it. Am I going to put it in the stock market and lose, or I'm going to put it in the bank, and then the bank goes bankrupt. So, if that's the case, I will make arrangement with the bank or with any financial institution of a forward rate agreement. One year from now, on May 12, 2017, I will borrow. And today, if the interest rate is 4%, maybe we'll agree on 4.1%. Maybe. Well, under economic circumstances, it may be that it's 3.9. But the point is, today, we're going to fix the interest rate at some number which will be close to today's number, could be 4.11. And 4.11 is the interest rate at which I will borrow one year from now. This guarantees me I'm going to pay 4.11. This makes, means that, well, $50 million. This means that I can make every single calculation up to that point and be sure that when I make all of my calculations and we call them in finance present values and I can use this as a discount factor, as a, we call this cost of financing, I'm sure that this will be a number one year from now. This one year from now, I'm going to borrow for 
let's say, three years to build that hotel. So it basically guarantees me a future interest rate. That's why I call it forward rate to grade. Again, the forward means it could be one year from now, nine months from now, six months from now, whatever I need it. Or, in my case, will be $50 million. That's why it's non-standardized. If it's standardized, it will be, let's say, for $1 million, six months from now. If I need $7 million, I'll do seven contracts, each one million. So that's a forward rate agreement. Okay, over the counter. Uh, recently, over the last 15 years, these mm, customized or non-standardized forward contracts have become a little bit more and more standardized and they have some secondary markets, but they were never meant to be traded on the secondary markets. And therefore, the alternative to uh, forward contracts are futures contracts. All right, back into this here. So, futures contracts first are standardized. Second, they are exchange traded. Because of that, they are usually very liquid. One of the key characteristics for exchange traded contract which reduces the risk is called mark to market. Let's put it in red. Mark to market means that there is a daily cash <coughs> settlement, which means that money is transferred between two accounts every single day at the end of the day. All right, let's do a gold futures example, okay? So, example, uh, you and me made a contract, I'll buy gold, the standard contract on all or most futures around the world is 100 ounces of gold, okay? Uh, the contract will be $1,250, okay? And if that's the case, let's say me and you, right? Okay, I got to write it, me and you, okay? So, what happens now? Uh, me, I'm going to be the long, you're the short. So, this is the contract price. And the price goes up to $12.55. Well, if it's $12.55 and I'm long, I'm gaining $5, you're losing $5. In my account, from $12.50 to $12.55, uh, I will get plus $500 at the end of the day because the contract up $5. Let's try to do this 100 ounces. The price is uh, here, the contract is 12 dollars 12 
55. I get plus 500, and now the price is $5 up. You're short, you lose $5 on 100 ounces, you lose $500. So, what will happen is, from your account will be transferred to my account $500. Okay, this is your loss for the day, and this is my gain for the day. Well, tomorrow, price goes to 1260 Again, I'm gaining $500, and you're losing again $500. Well, tomorrow, the day after, it jumps to 1280 Now I'm feeling lucky. I got plus. $2,000 and it got minus $2,000. And maybe then gold crashes. It goes down to $12.30. Suddenly, in a single day, you make $5,000 and I lose $5,000. Okay? This is each day by day. So, my initial balance, if it was zero, will be 500, then it's going to be 1,000, it's going to be 3,000, and now it's going to be minus 2,000, okay? So, that's how it goes. This is called mark to market. In other words, the futures price will have an initial contract price, and then every day there will be a price, and every day the price changes, there have to be a daily settlement. The settlement will be, uh, okay, I can now go back to this one, I'm running out of board, and maybe out of time, right? Is it time to take a break, right? Yes. Yes.